Kilpeck. As sweet in its simplicity is the white violets hiding on the banks all around in this small place in the Wormbrook Valley, so easily passed by, but with one of the most remarkable churches in England, carved inside and out by Norman craftsmen. Fame has brought little change to this church set in the fields, with a few cottages and a farm grouped casually about it. Rising on the other side of the church are moated earthworks, topped by fragments of walls among the trees. All that remains of the castle, William Fitznorman built for himself after the conquest. And only a few foundations remain, by the 17th century farmhouse called the Priory, of the monastery built by his son Hugh. But the church, which Hugh may also have built, is almost as perfect as in his day the only alterations being two or three medieval windows and the chancel doorway. That a still older Saxon church stood here is shown by the big stones left at the nave's northeast corner. Arthur Mee says that Kilpeck is one of our smallest churches, but nowhere in England is there a more complete array of Norman carving, all of it showing plainly the continuation of the Scandinavian ideas which influenced the Saxon carvers. The nave doorway, the 80 corbels encircling the outside, the chancel arch, the windows of the rounded apse and the ribs of its vaulting are all rich with these carvings, curious in design and amazingly preserved. It is incredible how they have withstood so well the rains and frosts and winds of 800 winters. Even the gaps among the outside ring of corbels were not caused by age, but by Victorians, shocked at some of the subjects represented. Of nearly 80 left supporting the heavy corbel table, the most comical pictures are a rabbit and a dog, which might give inspiration to Walt Disney. Then there are numerous birds and beasts, real and legendary, a deer and a falcon and a muzzled bear among them, a queer creature playing an unrecognisable instrument and a grotesque man with a primitive fiddle, a dancing figure in a kilt and two lovers kissing. A unique ornament are the three dragon mouths with curling tongues jutting far out at the west end, where there is a rounded window with heavy interlacing at the sides and foliage sprouting from faces on its capitals. But most remarkable in this array of outdoor sculpture is the doorway, where two soldiers in peaked caps, ribbed leather hauberks and bell-bottomed trousers stand one above the other on an inner shaft. Serpents twine round the two outer shafts, the other inner shaft is rich with interlacing, rising from two birds. Monsters grimace on the capitals and two great diapered stones support an arch heavy with fantastic designs. Here are two rows of carvings, the outer formed of nine medallions linked like a chain with eight grotesque faces upside down. Birds, monsters and fish are framed in the medallions. The inner row includes beaked heads, a human-headed lion, a phoenix among flames, a palm-bearing angel and eight dragons, five swallowing each other, one swallowing itself and one lying at each end of the arch. And the tympanum has a conventional design of flowers and fruit and rests on a lintel cut with chevron. Arthur Mee says that the very smallness of this church shows up the rich carving inside where three apostles stand one above the other on each side of a chancel arch noble with chevron. Three of these apostles hold crosses, two have scourges and Peter has a mighty key on his shoulder. A plain inner arch opens into the apse, a little gem with three deeply splayed windows framed in chevron, like the vaulting ribs running up between the windows to meet in four grotesque faces. By the chancel arch stands a low Norman stoop, its bowl clasped round by two arms, while four snakes guard the base and under the 17th century gallery at the west end of this miniature church is one of the biggest Norman fonts we have seen. Its great shallow bowl was hollowed from one block and is supported on four old shafts and a new one.